Therefore, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. I grew up in a small town in Minnesota, and I had two loving parents and a younger sister, and really had a, a great childhood. I remember doing lots of things uh, that were normal in rural middle America, such as playing in the woods and exploring, building forts, playing sports at school, and of course video games. And I also remember something that was equally normal, uh, perhaps too normal in our society today, and that was when my parents decided that they were going to get a divorce. Now, as an adult and a husband and father, I certainly have a different perspective that I had back then, and I don't hold anything against them, and they had some challenging circumstances. But that didn't matter to my 13-year-old paradigm, and it landed like an emotional bomb on the inside. And I liken that experience to being like my life's car getting on the wrong side of a median driving down the road. And there were some decisions I made in my heart that I really wasn't even aware of in my mind, such as, I'm not going to trust, I'm going to look for love outside the boundaries of family, and I'm really going to pursue my cause in life um, to make myself happy. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get my car back across because I hadn't gone back to that decision point. And apart from seeking love in the wrong places, uh, I was exploring, again, very normal things, alcohol, exploring with drugs, and also sex outside of marriage. But my chief ambition, if you will, my aim was really to be a musician. And my musical interests at the time were, were in techno music. I was a DJ. And so my ambitions found their, my musical pursuits found their place in the rave scene. Now, if you've never heard of the rave scene, it'd be kind of like Woodstock plus disco times technology. <laughs> and we used to throw warehouse parties, dark, dirty warehouses in the city. They'd start at 10 p.m., go till 6 a.m. And you can imagine a bunch of unsupervised teenagers trying to fill themselves. All kinds of crazy things went on there, but my desire was to be a local DJ, to begin traveling nationally and also internationally. And so as I began pursuing those goals, I started reaching some of them on a local level, but a confounding thing happened. The more I achieved those goals, the emptier I felt. And not only was I discouraged, but I became frustrated and also angry. It was around that time that my girlfriend, who was involved in all the same things I was, began to talk to me about something that was really strange. I remember walking one night, and out of the blue, she starts telling me about Jesus. And she was coming to her senses because as a young child, she had an upbringing in the church. And so... She would tell me how Jesus was real and how she was aware of his presence and she felt safe when she was with him as a little girl. And you would think that would be encouraging, but it was actually really irritating to me. And I think the reason it was irritating is because if you'd have asked me, are you a Christian, I probably would say, yeah. Culturally, of course, I was, but I had no knowledge of a relationship or a personal experience with God. But that's what I refer to as the the sand and the oyster, because I later read that the way an oyster forms a pearl is a small irritant, typically a piece of sand gets lodged in between the shell of an oyster and the tissue, and it, it irritates it, but over time it turns into a pearl. And that seed she planted did turn into a pearl. And I'll tell you about the night it unexpectedly happened. I was hanging out with some friends in my apartment right there. My best friend and roommate and some mutual friends uh, we were just, it was a normal night. And I remember something strange happening. I, said, I started to feel sick. I started to feel heavy. I wasn't sick, and I wasn't feeling down that night. And it started to frighten me because I knew it, it wasn't a normal situation. I went into my bedroom, which you can see the arrow pointing to right there. And while I was laying on my bed, I started praying. And I, I had prayed to God in general many times. I had friends who were Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, New Age, uh, the rave scene was a melting pot, and everyone was accepted for what they believed. I really felt everyone would end up in the same place in the end. So, um, But I was praying, and, and something different happened, though. I, I was aware of something, rather someone, who entered my room. And the only way I could describe the feeling was holy. 
I knew that God had come to visit me in response to my prayers of simply wanting to feel better. But not only was he listening to my prayers, I, I was fully aware he was answering them in real time. The only problem was I was feeling worse and worse. So as I prayed, I, I didn't leave the room. I could still see my wallpaper. I had a lamp in the corner, and I could hear my radiator hissing. But I felt myself descend to a place that was somewhere other than my room, and the eyes of my heart were opened up, and I saw myself in third person being driven as a slave. There was a slave driver on either shoulder pushing me and pushing me and pushing me. And it was the most intense labor I'd ever experienced, harder than any manual labor I'd done, harder than any football practice. And the comfort in life when you're going through something hard is that it will eventually end, even if that end might be death, but there was no comfort in that scenario because it was endless in duration. Not only that, it was getting worse and worse and worse by the second. I had no other words to describe the experience. The word hell came to my mind. I had always believed in hell, but I never believed I was going there. I really felt that, sure, I'd done some bad things, but my good would outweigh the bad in the end, and I'd slip through just in the nick of time. That might sound reasonable to a lot of people, but in the presence of a holy God, it just fell apart. So I prayed a different prayer. I'd never prayed it before. I said, okay, God, whatever needs to happen from where I am there to where I need to be, just do it right now. And at that point, everything accelerated and intensified again. But I began to have sins come to my mind, one after another. Lust, greed, drugs. And I don't even know that I verbalized it, but I simply acknowledged that it was true. And each time, I felt these weights lift. I felt lighter and lighter and lighter, and really emptier and emptier and emptier, to where after 12 or 14 of those, I don't remember exactly the number, I felt light, I felt clean. And the question I asked of how I need to get from there to here was answered. I didn't hear a voice, I didn't pray a special prayer, I just simply knew it was Jesus. And he died for those sins. And when I simply agreed and said, okay, peace came in and filled that huge vacancy that was just created. I went from having God on the outside to having him on the inside. That certainly changed my life. God had rescued me from the kingdom of darkness and transferred me into the kingdom of light. And I had nothing to do with it, as, as you just heard, other than just agreeing with him. I also should acknowledge that my mom was praying for me, I'm sure. I know my grandmother was. And a group of men were also praying in obedience to something God told them. I didn't even know them at the time, praying for myself and other friends. I got to later meet them. And they got to realize the fruit of their prayers. And a man named Fred Herzog, I got to thank him. Because he had seen a young group of people driven as slaves in a chain gang. And he prayed that they'd be set free. And around that time, all of us were being set free from our sins. And we ended up at their church. I'd be exaggerating if I said life got easier after that. It did in some ways. I stopped the overt sins of sex and drugs, but I kept the rock and roll, and I was starting to play out uh, locally and even nationally, and I, now I had Jesus, I was simply asking him to bless my plans, and I was sure he was going to do that. <laughs> and at that point, I had my little Matthew 4 experience. If you remember Jesus being in the wilderness, he was tempted three times. One of those was when Satan offered him all the kingdoms of the world if he would just bow down to him. Satan didn't come to me that overtly, but he came to me through a phone call. Brant, hi, it's me, Tyler. I'm in Germany now. I'm in charge of a big nightclub. We'd like to pay for you to come and move over here, and you can be an international DJ in Europe. You can play every night here. We'll get you bookings around Europe, and we'll work on a CD deal as well. This was in the 90s, so CDs were still cool back then. <laughs> Kids listening are wondering what that is. I said, I'll be on my way. I have to tend to a couple things. As soon as I hung up the phone, I knew I wasn't supposed to go. My heart was, had no peace. My mind was angry, trying to argue with my heart and convince it. My heart says, we don't need to convince him. We, this went on for two weeks, and so eventually someone introduced me to a pastor. I didn't know any pastors. His name was Gary. 
I thought, if I could just get a pastor to sign off on my plans, I can tell my conscience to be quiet. Things will be cool. <laughs> so he agreed to meet with me. I have no idea why. He's a pastor, I guess. It was a tornado warning night. There was no one in the restaurant, he and I and the waitress. So I gave him my pitch. He listened patiently. And I was expecting a little resistance, but he did the opposite. He said, well, sure, you can go if you'd like. I was caught off guard a little bit. So I leaned in and asked why. And he said, well... You can go, but let's just pretend your life's over and you're standing before the Father. And he says, son, this last part of your life when you were doing my will and walking in my plans, this is great, son. We're going to keep this for all of eternity. We're going to enjoy this together. These earlier years when you were just kind of doing your own thing and pursuing your own dreams, we're just going to throw that out. That counts for nothing. So you can go if you'd like to. You can figure it out, I'm sure. Well, this was my second brush with eternity. I turned the trip down. Peace came back to my heart. My mind was upset for a while. And a friend was going to my place because it was a trip of a lifetime, really. And halfway into his passport process, the whole thing evaporated and disappeared. I knew it was a custom-built temptation and trap just for me. I don't know if I would have had any physical harm. But I would have had eternal loss. And I came across a Bible verse and realized that Gary had a reason for what he was sharing with me, and it was in 1 Corinthians 3 when it says, if anyone lays a foundation, he shouldn't lay any other foundation than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds on that foundation, he should be very careful how he builds. If what he builds lasts, he'll have rewards using gold, silver, precious stones. But if if he uses wood, hay, and stubble, it'll be tested on that day, and it'll burn up. He'll escape, but only as one escaping through the flames. And God was impressing upon me that the decisions I made could be of the gold, silver, and precious stones of the wood, hay, and stubble. And he was showing me my desire and dream to bring techno music to other nations. It might be fun, but it would be wood, hay, and stubble, and that he would prefer I bring the gospel to other nations. So it became my uh, pursuit and desire, my new ambition, to try my best to live for eternity. And God redeemed that trip to Germany about 10 years later. I was able to go with the man who had prayed for me to help him start a church there. We've since started an organization to help the gospel go into nations that are unreached where they have no idea that a king is coming. They have no idea they have an opportunity to serve that king here on earth as well as in the age to come. And it's our goal to give them a heads up Not all of my decisions are that black and white or that dramatic, but I believe that he impressed that upon me, not only for my own life, but as I share my message with others. I believe it's his mercy. It's not to scare or intimidate people into making choices for God, but really it's a heads up because the choices we do make will last for eternity either way. I don't know about you, but I want the gold, silver, and precious stones by his mercy and grace. It's easy to lose sight of that eternal perspective. I'll be honest. You get in the throes of daily life and the busyness and work, kids. We see things like this all the time and it's easy to become cynical. We know Jesus is returning as the king, but it's so far off. It's taken so long. It's probably not yet. Who knows when it is? But there will come a day and an hour when he does return. He'll take those who know him And our stewardship here will have a lasting impact for eternity.